The world rolls under the long thrust of his heel. Over the cage floor, the horizons come. Which cage floor? Whose heels? Well, these are the lines of the famous poet Ted Hughes in his poem, The Jaguar. Jaguar by Ted Hughes. This particular poem came in a prize winning collection of poems titled Hawk in the Rain. and was published in 1957 and was published in 1957. This poem talks about a monotonous life at the zoo, a very vivid and keen description of the sedentary and monotonous life of the animals in a zoo as against the liveliness and energy of the jaguar. Let's have a look at the poem. Before I move into the poem, let me also bring to your notice about how jaguar, who is mentioned in, the, in this poem, is the only animal which finds life or which has life. And we've already seen in the previous class about Ted Hughes as an animal poet. We've also seen as to how he brings about images of animals in uh, his poems. So you can see animals, you can see birds, and there are a number of poems uh, that you can see where there are descriptions or there are uh, images of the animals that he brings in. You can see that there is a bond with the animals. He's very interested in animals. And this is one of his famous poems, The Jaguar. I'm sure most of us have been to a zoo. And I'm sure it's such an ex uh, exciting experience to be in a zoo. We would move cage after cages. We would be wanting to look at the animals. We would really want to have a glance at the birds and the animals walking in their cages. It's such an exciting um, experience altogether. Well, we need to see what happens here in this particular poem where the poet is at the zoo. He's kind of excited just like us when we are in a zoo, but we really have to get into the details of the poem whether there is any excitement about this particular zoo and the animals that he meets at the zoo. Let me read to you the poem. You can find this poem in the description box below. The apes yawn and adore their fleas in the sun. The parrot shriek as if they were on fire or strut like cheap tarts to attract the sto stroller with the nut. Fatigued with indolence, tiger and lion lie still as the sun. The boa constrictor's coil is a fossil. Cage after cage seems empty or stings of sleepers from the breathing straw. It might be painted on a nursery wall. But who runs like the rest past these arrives? At a cage where the crowd stands, stares, mesmerized. As a child at a dream, at a jaguar hurrying raged through prison darkness after the drills of his eyes. On a shot, fierce fuse. Not in boredom, the eye satisfied to be blind in fire. By the bang of the blood, in the brain deaf the ear he spins from the bars, 
but there's no cage to him. More than the visionary to his cell, his stride is wilderness of freedom. The world rolls under the long thrust of his heel. Over the cage, the floor, over the cage floor, the horizons come. Before I get into the poem, let me also tell you the framework of this particular poem. This particular poem has 20 lines of five stanzas set in quatrains. So you have 20 lines, five stanzas with four lines each. And there is no particular uh, or a specific rhyme scheme for this, uh, for this poem, but you can definitely see animal images, as I've already mentioned, similes and metaphors. Ted Hughes, in most of his poems, he used such metaphors or he uses animal images and he talks in a very figurative language. So let's have a look at the poem. As I've already mentioned, this poem starts in a way that the poet is in a zoo, looking at all the animals and the birds that he sees in each of these cages. The very first animal that he sees in the zoo are the apes. And how are these apes sitting? The apes yawn and adore their fleas in the sun. Well, basically, they are not vibrant as to how they are supposed to be. There's no energy, but they are yawning, they're basking in the sun. And the only thing that they adore are the fleas on their bodies. So this is the picture that he sees when he gets into the zoo. So the very first cage with the apes yawning and they're adoring their fleas. He moves forward. So you can see that, you know, this entire poem, there is an action. He's moving from one cage to the other. So the very first one, he sees the apes. The second one, you can see that he sees the parrots shrieking. It's shrieking and he uses a simile here and he says, the poet says that the parrots look like cheap tarts. For what? To attract the strollers with the nut. Now there is a simile here where the parrots resembles or they are like cheap tarts. Now what are cheap tarts? Here there is a mention of the prostitutes. So he says, just like the prostitutes who attracts the other person, the parrots out here is attracting the stroller or the visitor in the zoo in order to gain the nuts from them. So it's able to uh, get these nuts or its food only by attracting the other just as to what the prostitutes do. So there is a comparison that he brings out here. Then he moves forward. Fatigued with indolence, he looks at the next cage and he sees the tiger and the lion. Wow, what an exciting cage. Well, I'm sure we are all waiting uh, to see the tiger and the lion roar with its ferocious nature, with all its vibrance, with all its energy. What a beautiful sight altogether when we go near the cage of a tiger and a lion. But here the poet says the tiger and the lion, the lion who's supposed to be the king of the jungle. How does he see the poet here? He says they are fatigued with indolence. They're lazy, lethargic. There is no life in them. There is no authoritative power. There is no vibrant energy in them. 
absolutely lifeless. This is how he meets the tiger and the lion here. What a contrast. That is not how a lion and a tiger ought to be. But here in the zoo, he sees that they are captivated in the cage that they are in. And therefore, they are sulking, quite lethargic and fatigued. And they are all just sitting there simply with no life, just basking in the sun. If at all there is any movement, that is only with the parrots, where they are attracting the stroller with the nuts. So they all lie still as the sun. So here it says, the tiger and the lion who is fatigued with indolence lie still as the sun. Here the reference to the sun shows a symbol of authority. This implies that the lions and the tigers are dominant animals in the jungle, which we all know of. But here they have no such power because they are in the zoo. They have fallen off, fallen from their grace. And that is how he brings about when he says that the tiger and the lion lie still as the sun. Then he moves on to the next cage. So he sees the apes, he sees the parrots, he sees the tiger, lion, all of it which has no life at all. And then he moves forward. He sees the boa constrictor. Now who is a boa constrictor? Well, just by its name, we know it's a snake. So we know how these zoos um, are separated from, or, I mean, separated into cages. So you have the reptiles at one place, you have the birds at one place, you have, uh, you know, the uh, other set of animals in yet another cages. So you move forward, you move forward, you can see cages after cages. And here he comes to uh, the place where the reptiles are kept and he sees the boa constrictor. Now this boa constrictor is a large and a strong snake which is found in the Central or the South America. And something which is very significant about this animal is that they kill their prey by wrapping their bodies around them and crushing them to pieces. That is how fierce they are, this boa constrictor. constrictor. But look at them. They are lying in a coil in a round circular shape, but they look they are lying there just as a foil or here in this particular poem it says the boa constrictor's coil is a fossil. Again the metaphorical image is being used here when he says the boa constrictor's coil is a fossil. Now why does it look like a fossil? Here he says this looks totally motionless where it looks like an archaeological remnant. That is how he considers the boa constrictor and therefore it is a fossil. So the tiger and the lion fatigued with indolence, the boa constrictor is a fossil, the parrot shrieking and the apes adoring their fleas. This is what we see in the cage that the poet is in. Let's move further. He says, Cage after cage seems empty. He didn't say empty, but he said seems empty, which implies that there are, it means that the cages are not completely empty. There are animals in these cages, but it looks empty. Why? Because there is no motion. There is no energy. There is no vibrancy. There is absolutely no life. They are captivated in this cage. And therefore, he says, cages after cages. So it's not just one or two, but several cages. They all seem empty. There's no life. And then he says, the only thing that he can feel is a stings of sleepers from the breathing straw. 
Why the stink? You know when you go to a zoo, you know some of the cages, these animals are just lying down on the straw or the hay and you can see or you can sense that unpleasant smell from these cages. So we know that there is life in there, in these cages, only from the stings or the unpleasant smell that we have. That is how the poet knows that there is definitely life out there. It only seems empty. And this is the most interesting line. You know what he says? It might be painted on a nursery wall. Wow. What an imagery. I'm sure most of us have seen a nursery wall or a nursery school. They make sure that they draw a lot of paintings or caricatures or cartoons or animals, birds, everything just to get these small children attracted to the new environment that they are in. But here the poet says that just by looking at these animals totally motionless and lifeless, he feels as though these animals are just mere paintings on a nursery wall. The, the small little kids are not afraid of any of these paintings on the wall because there is no life. So that is what he feels here as well. No life. So it, it is rather just a painting. He doesn't feel that he's actually in a zoo meeting live, real animals. They're all, it might be painted on a nursery wall. But who runs like the rest past these arrives at a cage where the crowd stands? So as he moves on, looking at all these deadless animals, he feels that, you know, there is quite an energy out there, people running off to a particular cage and he's wondering as to what it is. And then he sees that the crowd stands, stares and mesmerized. Why are they standing? What are they staring at? Why are they so mesmerized? He says, they are mesmerized as though the child is dreaming. What kind of a dream is it? So we as readers are eagerly waiting for the next line because we have come to this brim point where there was totally um, you know, lifeless images in the first two stanzas and then we come here at this point where we feel that the entire readers along with the strollers in the zoo with the poet, they are all moving forward. They are all standing and staring and they are all mesmerized. What is it? He feels as though we are all dreaming or uh, no, just like a child at a dream. What are they looking at? At a jaguar hurrying enraged through prison darkness after the drills of his eyes. So what have they been mesmerized with? They've been looking at a jaguar. There is life in this particular cage, unlike, the, unlike all the other cages that he, he has just passed. The jaguar, enraged and hurrying in that prison darkness after the drills. So the visitors out here are looking at the, at the jaguar as though they are a child lost in a dream. The vigor that they see in this jaguar and its enraged, its walking hurriedly in an angry manner. And here I did also read to you, through the prison darkness, it talks about the cage it is in, after the drills of his eyes. So the cell that he is in or the, the cage that he is in is a little dark, but you can see that fears and uh, the ferocious nature of this jaguar in its eyes, the piercing sense in its eyes. And that is what these visitors or the strollers are mesmerized. They are spellbound by this jaguar which is in the cage. It is not sitting static just like other animals, but it's moving. 
with anger it's moving piercing eyes ferocious look vibrant energetic and it's moving about on a short fierce fuse it again shows as to how violent and frightening its eyes are the cage is no boundary to it but it's very angry it's moving about fierce nature of the jaguar well jaguar is actually the largest native cat in uh, central america and it resembles a leopard the only difference between the jaguar and the leopard is that i hope you've seen these small patches in a leopard's body you have the same patches in a jaguar's body as well but within those patches there are spots in it and that's how you differentiate a jaguar from a leopard it's much more stronger and fierce wider body as well so the jaguar is a very strong animal similar to a tiger and a lion they all belong to the cat family but here what can you see they are sleeping fatigued and here the jaguar with its violent nature frightening nature and again something which is very interesting about this term the etymology of jaguar it is uh, seen that it came from the word yaguara yaguara which means fierce or one who kills with the leap and this particular word came from one of the indigenous languages of brazil and it's from this word that we have jaguar a powerful predatory feline as i've already mentioned native to central or south america a very strong animal so what does it do look at the first line not in boredom absolutely no boredom at all the cage that surround him surrounds him has not affected him one bit there is no boredom to him and therefore he is hurrying from one point to the other within this cage and this is why they are all excited the visitors are excited just like how when we go to a zoo we are all we are always attracted to such creatures where they move about in their cages that is when we have that exciting experience then he says the eye is satisfied to be blind in fire why is it blind in fire because again it uh, mentions or it brings about the fierceness in the jaguar it's its power and that power blinds it all by the bang of the blood in the brain deaf the ear he spins from the bars but there's no cage to him so he's just turning around in vigor there is violent uh, motion out there and you can see that there is anger in his eyes he's spinning around in, in his bar or in this particular cage and then the poet says but there is no cage to him these physical boundaries that you have that you can see right in front of us it does not challenge him at all he feels that he is just the same old jaguar as to how he would be in the jungle so that primordial power that energy that vibrant nature is what he portrays in this particular cage at all there's no boredom and that is why he says but there is no cage to him and look at the next comparison 
more than to to the Vishnari himself. We know who Vishnaris are, who has a greater vision towards life which is to come. So he says, just like a Vishnari who extends his vision towards the future, the Jaguar is not in boredom who is surrounded by this captivating walls, but rather just like a Vishnari, he looks forward, he leaps forward. This cage is no barrier to him. But just as to how he would be in the jungle, he is carrying on with his regular activities, hurrying from one end to the other, turning about in vigor, that violent, ferocious nature, that fierce, piercing eyes that blinds us. And now we know as to why the visitors are mesmerized. Mesmerized by the activity, by the life, by the energy of the jaguar in his cell. Here cell means prison. His stride is wilderness of freedom. So you can see that though he is in captivity, he he is in dire need of freedom. He wants to be free. So you could also see uh, references, uh, since it's mentioned here as a visionary, some, someone who has uh, supernatural visions or uh, someone who has actions far ahead of his or her time. We know of people like Nehru. We know of uh, great personalities like Nelson Mandela, who was in their cells who was in jail, but yet their visions made them leap forward into future. The cage that they are in is no boundary to them, but rather they are free from it all. Their mind is wandering, their mind is always energetic and looking forward for what is to come or what they could do in the near future. So here, the jaguar in this cage also transcends the human visionaries who are chained by the societal needs. This is what we can see here in this particular poem as well. And we come towards the end of the poem and he says in the last stanza, his stride, as we mentioned, is wilderness of freedom. The world rolls under the long thrust of his heel. Over the cage floor, the horizons come. What does he mean by that? He sees the defiant jaguar held in captivity. The long thrust that is mentioned here, what is a long thrust? The long strides or the steps of the jaguar. And the jaguar stride is much more than the stride of the mind and the foot. That is how the poet explains it. And then you can also see about the thrust of his heel. What is a heel? You know, the rounded back part of the foot. So you can see that vigor in his heel. He's moving about, taking long strides. And then in the last line, it talks about the horizon. What is a horizon? I'm sure all of us know about what a horizon is. It's the line at, uh, at the point where the sky seems to touch the land or the sea. That's the horizon. But what does, it ha what does it do here in the last line? He says, over the cage floor, the horizon comes. What does that mean? It is as though the jaguar is moving on and on through endless horizons. Whatever horizons that we have set for him, the walls, the cage, the bars, these are the horizons that man has set for this jaguar at the zoo. But that does not hinder him at all. But rather, he is moving on and through endless horizons. Nothing affects him at all. And the vigor continues. The energy continues. That is why I started off this poem initially by saying, you can see that there is a vivid description of the sedentary and monotonous life 
of the animals in the zoo as against the life of the jaguar again found in the same zoo. So, the zoo and the cage is equal for all these animals. But here they have salt in their cages. They are quite lethargic and indolent in their nature in the zoo. But here you have the jaguar who is found in the same zoo, but rather who comes away from all the boundaries that man has set for him. Freedom. His mind is set free. There is no bondage. There's no boredom. As a visionary cell, he moves about, taking long strides. And yes, the jaguar moves forward, hoping that it would be free, or at least in its mind, it's completely free. This is what Ted Hughes talks to us in this particular poem, The Jaguar. We are all set by horizons or we are all set in our own boundaries. But how much are we free? Isn't it beautiful to look at these animals and to compare ourselves with the animals who are quite lethargic in nature and the one who is vibrant amidst the cage that he is in. The imprisoning of a visionary cannot incarcerate his profound thoughts of freedom of expression. That is what we saw with the, jag with the jaguar. And you can also see that the world is encompassed in the stride of his paw. As he enamors humanity with his innate elegance. What a beautiful poem. He's actually bringing about a relationship with man and nature just by bringing jaguar to us. An animal, a ferocious animal, yes. But here look at the ferocious animal. Animals, tiger and the lion. What about them? They're indolent and fatigued lethargic and this against the vibrant stride of the jaguar and this is how Ted Hughes brings forth to us or portrays the jaguar in front of us quite metaphorically and I'm sure you would have seen similes and metaphors I did mention to you about how parrots uh, are like cheap tarts a usage of simile and then the boa constrictor is a fossil is also a good example of a metaphor he uses figurative lang language metaphorically through these animal imageries he is bringing or trying to reunite man with nature thank you <laughs>